doing? Don't do this. Oh, God. This week on Talking About the Movies, the man that told you to shut up or else aliens will tell you limb from limb decides to go with a much different film for his third outing as a director. A film involving imaginary friends, and Ryan Reynolds is at the forefront of it. I say that's a double win. Let's take a look at John Krasinski's latest film, The Highly Ambitious If. Plus, I want people to hear my voice. The late great Amy Winehouse's story is told in a new biopic. Does it go down the same route as something like Bohemian Rhapsody or Whitney Houston or Bob Marley? Or does it go back to doing something unique and different like Rocket Man? Well, just stay tuned to find out. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at Back to Black. It's a double feature this week on Talking About the Movies. And welcome to another edition of Talking About the Movies, where, of course, we take a look at the biggest new releases of the weekend. And uh, as I've said before on uh, Movie Stop, I'm recording this on a Saturday night because I'm going out to the Mainline Autograph show tomorrow, which will be the time that you're watching this, actually. But um, uh, So I'm recording the reviews for these tonight because they're fresh in my mind. I just came back from watching both of these movies that we're going to talk about here. But uh, you should be able to see this right around the time I usually post these video these episodes of talking about the movies, so around 2 o'clock on Sunday, 1, 2 o'clock around there. But... Um, just doing it tonight so I can get that out of the way. I don't have to worry about doing that tomorrow after I get back from the show. But um, but uh, let's not waste any more time and let's get right to these two big movies. And we'll start off with the biggest of the two. And that is, of course, John Krasinski's latest film. And that is If. So in the movie If, you have a young girl going through a difficult experience, beginning to see everyone's imaginary friends who have been left behind as their real-life friends have grown up. Uh, she's been dealing with a lot of tragedy in her life. Her mother passed away from cancer. And her father, played by John Krasinski, is going in for open heart surgery. And um, as you see throughout the movie, she essentially finds this, these people upstairs. One of them is played by Ryan Reynolds, and the two are imaginary friends. You have a B, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. And you also have this big, this big uh, purple guy, played by Steve Carell, uh, who is very similar to a character of a, of a show I'm about to bring up, because... It's kind of hard to talk about this movie before we talk about the elephant in the room, and that, and that's the fact that this movie definitely feels like it's very similar to a little show you might remember about 20 years ago. In fact, this year will be the 20th anniversary of this particular show that I'm about to talk about here. Uh, this movie is very familiar to this particular show that I'm going to show you right now. Now, I'm not saying that John Krasinski intentionally tried to pretend that that show did not exist, but, um, I mean, one of the characters is a literal big purple furry monster, just like the purple furry monster that was on Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I mean, for God's sakes, the monster is literally named Blue, which was the main character on the sh main imaginary friend on the show. I mean, he's not as much of a jerk as, as Blue was on that show, but, but... I'm not going to be surprised if we find out down the road that he he took some of the ideas from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends because there are, it's definitely a lot of that in this movie. But there are the subtle changes that he makes to the story here that does make it stand out on its own a little bit. And, you know, this thing has been getting kind of a mixed reception from critics. Nobody's really saying it's a bad movie. They're just saying that... Um, most people are saying that it's just kind of underwhelming. It's got like a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. But then again, I always talk about how you can't really trust Rotten Tomatoes. In fact, when I saw that the movie got between 50 and 60% on Rotten Tomatoes, my first thought was, well, you know what, this movie probably will end up being a lot better than they say it will because, you know, whenever you see a splat like that and it's not below 30% or something like 30 40%, nine times out of ten... The movie is probably a lot better than the critics are letting on. And sure enough, not only were the critics wrong about this particular movie, not only did I really enjoy this movie, but honestly, this is probably one of my favorite movies of the year so far. I absolutely loved this movie. 
Of course, uh, John Krasinski made the Quiet Place movie, so he's already cemented his place as a, a filmmaker who knows what he's doing. And this is a very ambitious film. Uh, it's, it's a, like I said before, it's a mix of Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends mixed in with the, with, uh, the scene from Drop Dead Fred where Phoebe Cates' his character and her imaginary friend go to this place where all these different imaginary friends are there. And I feel like that's also kind of where John Krasinski got the idea for this because that movie is not very good, but that scene definitely introduces a lot of unique ideas about all these different imaginary friends in this, in this essentially this area where they can all become they can all be together and they still don't they're still kind of a, not ready to grow up like the like the people that they're hanging out with that type of stuff and um that movie didn't make it work but this movie surprisingly does and i'll say this it did start off slow it started off kind of slow about maybe the first about 30 minutes are kind of like they're not bad per se but it's definitely a lot of exposition exposition, and not really a whole lot of intrigue in terms of the story in general. But um, I think once we get to the actual, like, the Memorial Lane retirement home where all these imaginary friends are at, that's where the magic and the charm of this movie really starts to take off. And I love the ideas that this movie works around with here. Like, when they get to the retirement home, uh, this gr this little girl... Um, and this guy, and and uh, the Ryan Reynolds character go to the go there, and she, the the person who runs the kind of runs the facility in general played brilliantly well by Lewis Gossett Jr. I'll get to him in just a second and the cast in general, but uh, he inspires the the main character named B to use her imagination to redesign the facility, and I just love the way that Ryan Reynolds is so like he doesn't know what to do once the place starts going starts becoming more chaotic it starts changing around like i love that's where the magic and the charm of this movie really starts to take shape that from that point on i was in love with this movie i really thought that they did a phenomenal job of just creating a very fun idea that that is very similar to other things that we saw we've already talked about but it is able to do things that are different in its own way to make it stand out on its own. Like I think it does a very good job of telling a very intriguing story. I love the way that these characters become very are very likable. Like you really do like a lot of these characters. Like Kaylee Fleming, who I'm sorry I got your name wrong when I did my little tr first reaction coming out of the theater. I called you Kaylee Spaney, but that's a different that's a much older actress. But Kaylee Fleming, who plays B in this movie is pitch perfect. I mean, she is well, she's really, she does an incredible acting job in this movie. I was really surprised at how much I really liked her in this movie. Uh, John Krasinski also plays her father in this, and I like that he was, all, like, he knows that he's, he knows that this is a very serious situation, but he knows you still have to be, you still have to have a little bit of confidence and, in, in like, it's in a little bit of happiness in your life. Like, he knows that, he knows how serious this is, but he knows that like, like, her kid, her, his kid needs to be a kid, and she always talks about in the, in the first thirty minutes, like she's a, like she's not a kid anymore, and like that type of stuff. And I was, there's a lot of the time, I was really afraid they were going to go down that route where the movie kind of falls apart because they got to do the tropes and all that. But I'm so glad that they don't do that in this movie. And you know, you really do like these characters, and you really do not want to see any of them get into a situation where, like, it's like they're. They have to do something against their character and all that. Like, there's no dislike. There's no like unlikable characters in this movie. Everybody in this film is very likable, and that's what I really appreciated about this movie in general. Like, I love that it doesn't do the tropes. It doesn't do the cliches. There's no big third act breakup or a realization or a moment where one character is growing as a character, and then we've got to push back because we expect to have that in that type of a film like this. But that does not happen, and thank God for that. I mean, like, it's a movie that really is a very uplifting and very heartfelt film, and it's helped because of the amazing cast. I mean, like I said, Fleming is great. Ryan Reynolds is Ryan Reynolds doing the best that he does. John Krasinski is great. Uh, I forget how much I love Fiona Shaw. She's one of the few things that made Three Men and a Little Lady worth watching, uh, the sequel to Three Men and a Baby. And here, she's really good playing the grandmother in this. Uh, you also get... Even little characters that you really do, you really find yourself getting attached to, like there's a there's a subplot about this there's a little subplot about this woman that lives on the same floor that Cal does, and she's a, she uh, Cal sees her as like the wicked witch or something like that, and then you find out at the end of the movie she's just a normal old lady, and the the imaginary friends are very creative and very fun to watch. Like you have a really good 
ensemble cast here. I mean, of course, you hear Steve Carell, you hear Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Louis Gossett Jr., Aquafina, John Krasinski's a marshmallow in this, Emily Blunt, George Clooney, Bradley Cooper is a thing of ice, Matt Damon, Bill Hader, Richard Jenkins, um, uh, Ke Keegan-Michael Key, Blake Lively, Sebastian Menasculo, Christopher Maloney, Matthew Reese, Sam Rockwell, uh, Maya Rudolph, Amy Schumer, John Stewart. Brad Pitt plays Keith from the trailers, and Keith doesn't say a damn thing, and yet he gets casted as Brad Pitt in this. And, like, what's great about all these characters is that most of them, you never really know until you look at the credits and you're just like, wait, that person played that person? That played some... I was trying to figure out who who the, the guy with the super, the super Super Detective Cosmo was. I had no idea that was Christopher Maloney. Now, some voices you can easily tell. You can tell what Keegan-Michael Key sounds like. You can tell who Sebastian Menasculo sounds like. You know, Louis Gossett Jr., Steve Carell, Aquafina. But, like, I had no idea that George Clooney was, a, was the spaceman. I had no idea that Bradley Cooper was the thing of ice. I had no, I had no idea that Matt Damon was the sun was the sunflower. I thought he was the art teacher. I didn't know that was Richard Jenkins. Like, that's just the great thing about this movie. This movie does a, does what Doolittle couldn't do with its ensemble cast. It's just like, they know how to use their ensemble cast in this to make you realize that, oh, this person played that person. This play, play, person played that person. Like, you have no idea. And it's really fascinating to take a look at. This did, like I said, it did what Doolittle failed to do with its ensemble cast. Because with Doolittle... You knew exactly who the voices were. You knew that one of them was Tom Holland. You knew one was Craig Robinson. You knew it was Emma Thompson, Selena Gomez, all those different... Octavia Spencer, uh, you name it. Like, you know who those voices were, and you knew that they weren't really doing anything that special or unique or different. Here, it's the complete opposite. It, it works so perfectly well. Louis Gossett Jr. is amazing in this movie. I don't know if he thought... Is, I don't know what they... Is how he knew, knew that he had to go out in style, but man, his performance in this movie... The last thing you hear from him is just like, it rivals what Jimmy Stewart did in the American Tale of Five Goes West. A movie that's not that great, but I swear, Jimmy Stewart's final line in that movie is just absolutely amazing and a great sum up, a great way to end his illustrious career. And in this movie, if this is the last thing that we see from Louis Gossett Jr. because he passed away a month before this film came out, this is going to be right up there with that. I mean, this is just a perfect way for that character to go on. There was even a nice little tribute in the end credits, too. I mean, just... Such an amazing film. I do like the changes. I do like the twist that they turn in, that they give you here, in terms of where you think the story is going to go. Because you know the whole thing is about you know you know B Cal and the Blue have to figure out you know how to get these how to how these imaginary friends are going to move on in their life because they try first to go to like different kids. You know, uh, there's a kid named Benjamin in here who's very who does a very good job in this, played by um, Alan Kim. Uh, he was also in the movie Minari. He's real. He's really. He's, these are likable characters in general. And you know, he has. She has. The, but he has this idea. Like, okay, we're gonna audition these imaginary friends and see if he can see any of these imaginary friends. And they don't really know how this how this whole thing works. And so when they unfortunately can't figure out what's going on, is what's going on. Why I can't see him? It's not. It's not like a big deal either. It's just like. It, it, B says, "I'm sorry, we couldn't do that." And B says, "Like, oh, that's okay. At least I have you." And it's just like. Again, I love that it doesn't go down that route when it needs to. Like when it needs to get dramatic, it's at the it's at the perfect amount of time to do it. And um, and I like the way that they have the idea of you know, you know, B decides to talk with her grandmother and says she pictures herself as a young dancer and recognizes Blossom, uh, which is Phoebe Waller Bridge's character, as the background in the background of the picture. So she decides to test the idea of you know. You know, he, you know, he basically tells her before, uh, Lewis basically tells her beforehand, like, you know, you have to, you know, the idea is that you, the idea is that you, maybe ifs don't need new kids, but rather reunite with their old ones. That's a great scene, too, where they're just sitting on Coney Island Pier and they're, they're closing their eyes and they're thinking back to the old, good old days. And you see the carnival where you see all the different characters walking around. It's like in the past. And like, in the, in this case, you know, B decides to test Lewis's idea and plays a Spartacus record, inspiring uh, Fiona Shaw's character to dance, and she remembers Blossom instilling B with hope, and you see this light that comes out with them, and it's just a great scene. Like, it really shows you what kind of was the ideas that they have for here, here, and it works just so well. And then Blue has to do the same thing with this kid named Jeremy, who's played by Bobby Moynihan, and 
it's funny because their initial attempt to try to do this doesn't really work, and then you know, B and Cal have to remind him of the of reuniting them, giving him the confidence that he needs to nail, nail a presentation, and it's just a ve- it's just a very it's very w- interesting and very well thought out that they did it this way, and I like that they took those chances and actually did something unique and creative with it. I forgot to mention that I was surprised to know that the choreography in this was done by, of all people, Mandy Moore, and you know what? She's probably got a good future in choreography because there's a great scene in that scene I was talking about before when they're redesigning the facility where they somehow end up in the music video for, of all things, Tina Turner's Better Be Good to Me, and everybody's... Everybody, including the the imaginary friends in B, go up and start dancing on the stage, and and then of course there's those scenes where you know uh, her her grandmother's dancing and her father's playing around in the beginning with the IV thing, and you know what? They were really good dance moves, and I guess if she's got a future in choreography, there you go. Um, but the dramatic moments I thought were very well done. I like the is I like the idea that you know there's a moment towards the end of the movie where you know. B basically is very scared that something bad happened with her father's operation. She runs upstairs to comfort him and tells her the story about, and tells her a story. And, you know, most people can relate to something like that. You're really afraid that someone that you love is going to die on you like this. And, you know, you always get scared for that. And, like, hell, I get scared of that, too. Like, I, I'm always scared that somebody I love, which I recently lost a family member, and I was really scared that that this was going to happen. It's is that it was going to happen, and unfortunately it did, and, and still the, most of my fa- with all my family members, and like, I can relate to something like this happening and feeling those emotions that she has. This is really where that actress, Kaylee Fleming, really shows her all here, and, you know, she's telling her that she tried to be a grown-up, but she she's basically telling her to keep trying to bring the fun back into her life, and that she still needs him, and of course, that's the thing to wake her up, and you never, and you probably know that, and you, they've set up kind of right away that you know, he's kind of a he's kind of a lighthearted person that even in the situations like this, you know, you, you have to you have to bring some fun into your life, and I like that that's the thing that actually makes the ifs go away, and then you kind of realize they show off the big twist here, which really, if you watch the movie carefully you can kind of figure out what the twist is going to be right from the get-go, and I kind of figured it out early, and, you know, I didn't mind it so much. You know, it was kind of like with Zootopia, when you saw the Jenny Slate character, the ma- the assistant mayor, the assistant to the mayor, and you find, and you kind of piece it together that, okay, she's probably in on this, and she's probably the bad guy, and yep, sure enough, she's the bad guy. It's But it never really ruins the ebb and flow of the movie. It never really ruins the fact that, you know, that this is the thing that you is this ruins the film in general. Nothing about this film gets really ruined. If, and if anything, it's more of a nitpick, in my opinion, with the way that twist is, because, I mean, it could have been better handled, but it did because, uh, but like I said, it doesn't hurt my enjoyment of the film, because I really enjoyed this film. I haven't even talked about the music, Michael Giacchino with a great score. The cinematography is incredible. This is uh, Janusz Kaminski, who's done a lot of Spielberg work, and there are great shots in this movie that are... So, it's like you could tell John Krasinski had a lot of fun with some ideas for homages of various things like Busby Berkeley Productions, you know, these incredible dance sequences in general. Like, it's a really well-made film. Like, I really found myself enjoying this movie a lot more than I think a lot of people will. I think this is a fascinating film. It's a film that I think will become a family classic down the road, if it, if it, even if it doesn't get the proper reception it'll get right now because, you know, unfortunately... Original IPs aren't selling at the box office right now. It's going to find its legs going forward. Like, tw- 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about this as one of the great new family classics. And I think this is a film that is so much fun. It's so well done. D- John Kuczynski once again shows that he has the abilities to direct and really make a lot of intriguing films. And this is a chance for him to branch out of something outside the Quiet Place movies. I think he did a fantastic job with this movie. I'm probably going to be one of the few people that will probably have this in my top 10 list for the year. This is one of my favorite movies of the year, and I'm really looking forward to checking this out again down the road. I mean, I can't wait to watch this again. A great movie, very very well done, a good mix of comedy and drama, excellent cast, great visual effects, great cinematography, great music. What more can I say? It's a masterpiece. I really enjoyed this film so much. I give it a big thumbs up. I say definitely go see it, definitely check it out. You will not be disappointed by it whatsoever. 
So that's if. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the last, the second film we have here, the second new release this weekend, and that is the Amy Winehouse biopic Back to Black. So, of course, Back to Black is a celebration of the most iconic and much-missed homegrown star of the 21st century. Back, Back to Black tells the story of the extraordinary tale of Amy Winehouse, painting a vivid, vibrant picture of the Camden streets where she called home and captured the struggles of global fame. It honors Amy's artistry, wit, and honesty, as well as a tr trying to understand her demons, an unflinching look at the modern celebrity machine and a powerful tribute to a once-in-a-generational talent. That's what the studio is telling you about this movie. What I'm telling you about this movie is, is that it's another biopic. It's another one of these safe, sanitized biopics. And um, while it's not as bad as something like Bohemian Rhapsody or something as generic as uh, Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody, or um, uh, Bob Marley, One Love, it's just a film that disappoints me. And I think this is probably one of the, bi the biggest disappointments I've had with a movie like this since the Whitney Houston movie because... As much as I love Whitney Houston's music, I really love Amy Winehouse's music. I love Amy Winehouse's library of music. My favorite song is from hers is You're no, You Know I'm No Good. And when I saw her, this actress played, played by uh, Marissa Abella, I thought, that's perfect. That's pitch perfect casting. And like, like, she really is the best thing about the movie. She really is the one thing that I will say to this film's credit. She gets it. What she gets the. She understands the assignment. She knows exactly what she's supposed to do. She knows exactly how to make the role work. Like, that's the one reason you should check this movie out is to see that great performance by her. Everything else, it's your typical biopic. It's a film that's clearly made, but it's it's obviously made by the people who, you know, it's a film. It's a movie made by the Winehouse Estate. Because, so that means that they want you to tell the most safest, sanitized story possible, with the tiniest little bit of the dark. The darker stuff here, but come on, man. We know the story behind the scenes of Amy Winehouse. Like, it's like I said before with the Bob Marley movie. Like, don't be afraid to tell the real story. Tell the real story. We know that Amy Winehouse did have some problems behind the scenes. It's okay to show the darker side of this and not be afraid to be to feel uncomfortable because you know what? You could, you know what? To make a movie that's basically showing you that. She's the sweetest, most she's the sweetest person who never did anything wrong in her life. That's a load of crap. Like, like if you a good biopic should be able to look at the good stuff and the bad stuff and balance it out. And I don't think that this pe the people who made this movie really had that intention going for it. It's a really simplistic approach because it's something we've seen done to death so many times, and you know, it's just such a disappointment on so many levels because they got the right person to play the role. It, the pieces were right there in general, but it was just, it's just an unsettling mess of a film that is just, it's really more of an insult that this film goes as safe as it does, and it just really goes to show you that we're really never going to have a biopic that's really going to tell both the good side and the bad side in a way that's that's very, that's more interesting and more clever than what we've been getting. Like, we need more movies like a Rocket Man, you know? We need a film that a film that is a fantasy but tells a lot of the stories based on what happened with in Elton John's life and is not afraid to show the darker side of things while also showing the positives and it's just it's a film that is just a mess on so many levels it's a film that is so it's just so uneasy uneasy to watch and it's just like what a disappointment this was but then again this is from the same director that gave us the masterpiece of garbage that was 50 shades of gray would you expect anything less from the same person who took, who sanitized that mo movie into an R-rated film that was clearly should have been, that if they really wanted to go as far as they could with this, they should have made that NC-17. Like, yeah, you may not, it's, it doesn't matter what the rating is. People were going to see that movie regardless. But no, Universal said, well, NC-17 doesn't sell. We got to make that an R-rated movie. Movie, so you know, we, the, you know, mothers can bring their daughters in there too, and the babies as well. Why don't? It's because nobody's really checking the age ages on kids anymore, like. But in this film's case, I think it's more insulting because it's another. It's just another biopic that is basically a that's basically just a, a sanitized version of this person's life, who clearly, there clearly the stuff that was out in the open was what we should have seen in this film, but it doesn't want to go down those routes. It doesn't want to go down that dark route because it wants to show its main character as a hero and a person that 
was under unforeseen circumstances, and that's what dragged her into these moments right here. And it's just the even the ending of this movie where it just it just doesn't really work because it it's feels like they're trying so hard to do like a scarlet a ninety scarlet letter and give this this unfortunate dark story a happy ending to it, which is always a bad idea. And here it's just it just ruins what could have been a really good film. And I don't really want to say. I don't really want to tell you that it's one of the worst movies of the year. It really is. It's, But it really is when you really look at it. As much as I love this performance by Marissa Bella, and that's the only reason you should really watch this movie, there's nothing else about this film I can recommend with about it. It's just, it's just such a disappointment that we still have to keep doing this. And it's going to keep happening again because we've got the Michael Jackson movie coming out next year. And it's written by the same guy that gave us Bohemian Rhapsody. So we already know what direction that's going to go. I hope that it doesn't go down that route. I hope I'm proven wrong by it. They actually aren't afraid to do, to go to balance it out. But we know it's going to go down in that direction. Plus, that should be that should be more than one movie. Not to, it should not be just one film in general here. That's the Michael Jackson story is the one that should be more than one movie. It should be at least two movies because so much so much goes on in that life of his. But like, do like a two part film or something like that with Michael Jackson. Don't try to cram it all into one movie. But like I said, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt because they've got a good director behind it. But. I'm not getting all my hopes up on this, on on that film being any being any better than this. I mean, hopefully it's better than this movie because this was just such a disappointment on so many levels. I mean, wasting a great performance by Marissa Abella, it's just that's the worst thing about the whole thing is because they have a perfect person who's pitch perfect for the role, and they don't have a good movie around her because. The Winehouse family wants to make this this as safe as safe as safe and marketable as they can to make her daughter look better and pretend like she pretend like she's not the worst person, like she, nothing bad ever happened in her life. I mean, like it's just it's inexcusable how bad this is. The more I think about it, the more I just unfortunately have to give this a big thumbs down. This is probably up there with one of the worst movies of the year, mostly because. As much as I love this performance by Marissa Bella, it should have been in a much better movie than this. And that just, it really hurts me to really give it that rating. But unfortunately, I really do not have any other reason except for that performance to just watch to watch this movie ever again. And even then, I'll just wait for it to come out on, to, to, for the clips to come out online. Because they're going to put the clips of her in this, her online. After, and it'll just show you that this is a great performance that deserved to be in a much better movie than this. So, yeah. Big disappointment. And uh, really, I shouldn't be that surprised considering the track record we've had with biopics that are very similar to this. And, and unfortunately, it's just another one to add to the list. So, so anyway, that's my review of Back to Black. So uh, a 50-50 weekend. We have a really good film from Duran Kosinski with If and a lackluster film with a great performance that definitely deserved a lot better. So, so anyway, uh, the next time we meet... It's going to be uh, the new Furioso, the new Mad Max prequel, and then we also have the Garfield movie. Now, that might not be next week because uh, I guess we're still going to this baseball game, to the Pirates game against the Braves for my brother-in-law's birthday. So so there's a possibility that there won't be a review next week, but there'll definitely be a review the following week unless something happens next week. But, uh, you know... Either way, there's going to be a review for Furiosa and the Garfield movie, whether it's going to be next week or the week after that, because nothing is going to really open after the, is after this week, uh, not until the following week after the after after May 31st, and that's going to be um, the new Bad Boys movie. So, but um, thank you guys so much for watching this. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below on both If and Back to Black. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? I'd love to know your thoughts down below. And uh, if you liked what you see here, check out some, check out my last review I did for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Check out some of the other reviews I've done. Hit the like and subscribe button, and uh, I will see you guys next time. So until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.